Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Carolyn Bernstein. I'm an assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. I'm an associate neurologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. This is Headache. I am a double-boarded headache specialist. I'm really glad to have the opportunity to talk to you. I've got a lot that I hope to cover for you, and so I'm going to talk really fast, um, but try to get everything in. Okay, these are my disclosures. Um, these are my goals today, that we have understanding of diagnosis of common types of headaches, especially things that might show up on your boards, red flag recognition, uh, that you understand the key points of the workup for headache, that everyone's familiar with treatment, medication, and integrative therapies as well, and some preparedness for board questions. Um, so this is just kind of funny. According to an article in The Telegraph, average attention of humans has fallen to eight seconds, less than a goldfish. I am sure that you're all going to uh, have a longer attention span than that. So question one, what is a headache? And, and definition from the dictionary, pain in the head, a vexious or baffling situation. Meetings have become a giant headache. Hopefully this one is not for you. People mean a lot of different things when they talk about headache. And so usually I start a visit by asking them what's really going on to define their, their process. And it's not always what I think it's going to be. So we divide headaches up into primary headaches versus secondary headaches, with primary being idiopathic, that, that is, they're not caused by something else. They're non-structural lesions, um, and they are a rule-out diagnosis. So before you feel comfortable making a diagnosis, say, of migraine, you have to make sure that nothing else is going on. The secondary headaches um, are obviously secondary to some kind of underlying process, a tumor, an aneurysm, an infection, some kind of inflammatory condition. I'll show you examples of those. Psychogenic headaches, I just want to touch on this quickly. There's a nice summary by my supervisor, our chairperson of uh, headache medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital. It's on the Headache Cooperative of New England website. Um, hard to treat a psychogenic headache, hard to make a, a good uh, diagnosis, but basically a headache associated with a psychiatric origin. And it can exist with other primary and secondary headaches. So before assigning this diagnostic uh, category to a patient, you want to make sure that you've ruled out the serious secondary causes. So office evaluation of headache, the essential things. How long have you had this headache and where on your head? And this is where a visualization is great. Um, now we're all doing these Zoom visits, but you know, show me where on your head it hurts. This is really different than this, which is really different than this. Um, quality of the pain, I usually ask people to describe and then I give them choices, stabbing, throbbing, aching, pounding, pressing. People usually select their pain quality, not always though, so you may have to try to tease it out. Important question, is it positional? Does it get better lying down or sitting up? Accompaniments, nausea, vomiting, sound or light sensitivity, dizziness, which is separate than vertigo. And again, using those little signals, sometimes you have to just spin your finger in the air for a defined vertigo for a patient because people who are vertiginous always think they're dizzy. People who are dizzy are not necessarily vertiginous. Are there focal neurologic symptoms, especially visual, double vision, blurry vision, numb or weak on half your body? Uh, uh, all important questions to ask. Patients may not think to tell you unless you ask specifically. How long does the headache last? Untreated, sometimes it's hard to get a clear answer. Most people, when they're in pain, they try to treat it. What's the degree of the disability that someone is having? And especially for migraine, is there a family history? More and more of these headaches um, are genetic. We're beginning to understand that. And so that can be a helpful diagnostic clue. Red flags, first or worst, new and different. Is there loss of, of consciousness or alteration in level of consciousness? Are there focal signs? Is this a new headache that presents with hemi body numbness? Is it getting increasingly worse? Or do you need to start thinking about a tumor headache? What's the ecology of the person? Do they have underlying cardiovascular disease? Do they have an underlying malignancy? Anything else that you can think of? So um, these things should alert you to the fact that you need to do some kind of specific workup these are alarming signs. <clears throat> so International Headache Society has written diagnostic criteria. There's 142 pages of headaches. I don't think you need to know all of them by any means. Um, I do have the website at the end of this talk. Um, the organization of the criteria is very specific, but they're clearly defined. So if you're wondering about something, you can Google this. You can look it up and make sure that your patient does or does not meet the criteria. It's useful for uh, 
reference, and I'm going to just say there is a ton of esoterica in this. I'm sorry, I'm going to grab a drink, which is not necessarily relevant. So we're going to focus first on primary headaches. Um, I'm sorry, part of this is cut off, but I'm going to explain it for you. So migraine headaches come from the Greek word hemicrania, half the head. Um, the location can vary. Sometimes they're on both sides, but usually people will put their hand over their uh, temporal area um, or their eye. Cluster headaches, by definition, are either over the eye, behind the eye, on one side, and they're always on the same side. Um, an attention type headache can be a band like headache around the head. So it's all about location. Migraine, one sided, lasting a minimum of four hours untreated, four to 72 hours is the definition. It is throbbing pain of moderate to severe intensity. You may need to say to people on that pain scale, one to 10, where is it? It's got to be at least a level five or greater. Um, they either need to have photophobia and phonophobia or nausea or vomiting to meet the diagnostic criteria. It's pretty rare, I think, that people vomit without feeling nauseous, but sometimes it can happen. This is the way the criteria have been structured. Somebody has to have at least five events. I see people sometimes who have presented to the ER with a new onset headache. They're diagnosed with migraine. You can't do that. You have to have at least five events. It can be probable migraine. It can be migraine-like, but you want to rule out anything else if it is a new onset headache. Migraine with aura, you only need to have two attacks to make the diagnosis. Um, the symptoms have to be fully reversible. They have to last for more than five minutes and fewer than 60 minutes. Um, the most common kind of aura is the visual aura that we all know about. It's the scotoma, the hole in the vision. It can scintillate, it can sparkle. The glowing zigzag that moves across vision is pretty common. A sensory type of aura is also common. You can have numbness, say, in your hand or your face. You can have speech abnormalities that sound like an aphasia the first, the second time this happens. It's really scary for people, and you can't make the diagnosis until it's recurred. In other words, you cannot make a diagnosis based on just one attack. Um, this is a picture I really like that I sometimes will show patients in the office. It's, this is a pretty classic kind of scotoma, this brightly colored glowing zigzag. Um, so with migraine, I have this little animation here of cortical spreading depression. We have a pretty good uh, uh, work uh, understanding of exactly what goes on with the migraine. There's a whole uh, hyper excitability that's occurring within the brain. Oftentimes for people with migraine with aura, it will start in the occipital lobe, it will propagate up and forward. It will move into the thalamus um, where um, the uh, pain receptors begin to be triggered. It can spill into the hypothalamus, nausea, vomiting, moves into the brain stem, and eventually ends up in the um, trigeminal caudal, uh, cervical, uh, cervical region, um, which is what causes that one-sided throbbing pain. But it's a series of events that take place. Um, other migraine variants, we have menstrual migraine, which occur, which occur only with menses. We have complicated migraine, which is migraine with focal neurologic symptoms during the event. Hemiplegic migraines, which are pretty well understood at this point, often familial. Um, you can do genetic testing for this. I will tell you it's not covered by very many insurers, which is unfortunate, um, and it's very expensive. That's a migraine that, when it occurs, half the body will become weak or paralyzed, looking for all the world like a stroke. You have to do a stroke workup. Uh, when this occurs, um, patients have often had several stroke workups by the time they roll into a, a, an outpatient headache clinic. Um, and then chronic migraine, by definition, lasts at least 15 days out of the month. Um, minimum of uh, eight of those days are migraine. The other seven can be more of a headache, doesn't necessarily have the exact same phenotype. Um, this can be very disabling. And once people chronify, yes, that really is a word, it can be very hard to flip it back to reverse it so that they have episodic migraines once again. So the way you make this diagnosis is you have to have patients keep a, a calendar or a diary. 
Tension type headache, another primary headache. The old names were really cool. They were very descriptive. These used to be called hat band headaches. These are the headaches that, you know, most of us have probably had at some point or another. It's a band of pain that goes around the head. Um, it's on both sides. The pain doesn't throb. It's pressing, pressing or tightening, mild to moderate in intensity. It can last between 30 minutes to seven days. Usually it's a couple of hours. Um, there are some infrequent variants. Um, uh, I'm sorry, there are some variants. You can have infrequent, frequent, chronic. I'm sorry, the way this formatted is a little funny here. Um, there's not nausea or vomiting. And usually people will have mild sound or light sensitivity. These headaches people can often carry on with work. These are not um, debilitating. Um, chronic daily headache, what is it actually? Um, I'm sorry, it's a headache that persists every single day. There's debate about what causes it. Is it actually migraine headache that becomes less typically migrainous over time? Is it a, a entrenched tension type headache? What should the treatment look like? There's, there's still quite a bit of debate about this. If you're seeing somebody who's got a daily headache and it's getting worse, you should think about underlying other causes and that's where you might want to image. So then we get to the trigeminal autonomic cephalgias, the tax, sunct, suna, the cluster headaches, and hemicrania. These are good things to focus on for board questions because they are so specific. Um, the sunks, this stands for short-acting unilateral headaches. Um, they're much, much briefer than any other kind of trigeminal autonomic cephalgia. They usually have tearing in one eye or redness. They're almost always on the same side. They last between five, 240 seconds, multiple times a day. Once you know what this is, you will begin to recognize it when people describe it to you. The sunas are the, a little bit longer, and these really differentiate for the most part by the length of time. These guys last from two seconds to as long as 10 minutes. This unilateral orbital above the eye, temporal, kind of stabbing, pulsating pain, but they're quick. They're not migraines. They don't have the sound and light sensitivity or the other features. Cluster headaches. I had a professor in medical school who called these Clint Eastwood headaches for unclear reasons, funny things stick. Um, these are, cluster headaches are more common in men than women. They're often seasonal. They last between 15 minutes and 180 minutes. One-sided pain, always on the same side, very severe. You have tearing, your nose can run, your eye can get in injected. Um, you can have uh, 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 watering of the eye. Um, the pupil can change in size. You can also develop ptosis. Migraine sufferers want to lie in the dark with ice on their head, and cluster sufferers pace around. They move around a lot. Um, it, the pain is different. People debate which is worse. I don't know that I think it really matters. Both migraine headaches and cluster headaches are treatable. You just have to be able to recognize them. So if you're seeing someone who's telling you that they have this terrible pain, always on the same side, behind one eye, waking them up at night, ask them these other questions. Do you have tearing? Does your nose run? Does your pupil change size? And then think about a diagnosis of cluster headaches. One cool thing is that people now will um, make a video on their phone of what they look like, which is just really helpful when they show it to you. Even over Zoom, it does work. You can see it, and that helps with the diagnosis. Um, hemicrania, I want you all to know about this. This is really important to recognize because these headaches are very specifically endomethacin responsive. These are headaches that are side locked. They're always on the same side. They're often further back on the head. Um, they can be behind the eye. They last between two and 30 minutes. They can be very severe. If you see someone side locked headache, even without the other symptoms, put them on a two week trial of endomethacin. The dose is 50 milligrams every eight hours or so with food, um, have them stop other NSAIDs, obviously. If it is hemicrania, it will dramatically resolve. So you want to make that diagnosis or at least look for it. It is a specifically endomethacin responsive headache. When to image and what to order, red flags, we talked about focal symptoms, people who are older, over the age of 50, the differential begins to look different. Headaches that are positional, could this represent a CSF leak? Could this represent increased intracranial pressure? Um, both of those are, may show some specific signs on MRI imaging. I, I often will give patients the Choosing Wisely article 
um, from that, that really nice series because it, it really talks about the fact that most people with headaches don't need imaging. But I can tell you as a headache specialist, most people who come to see a headache specialist want to get imaging because they're worried that they have a tumor. And it's, it's our job, it's my job to reassure them, no, I don't see anything focal. These are the things that are reassuring about your headaches. Bad things get worse. You're telling me you get one or two headaches a month. We don't need to do imaging. Or, yeah, I'm concerned about you. This is what I, I want to do, and this is why I want to do it. So um, that article, I think, is, is helpful and validating for patients when you don't need to image. Should you order a CAT scan or an MRI scan? CAT scan is useful um, in terms of headache for looking at blood and bone. If somebody's had trauma, if they've got a post-concussive headache, might be helpful. Acutely, if somebody rolls into the ER and you're worried about a subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, you might want to consider it. Um, if somebody's got acute neurologic changes and you're worrying about a stroke, it might be helpful in that situation. MRI scan, again, acute neurologic changes, preferable if you can get it. Um, if you're worried about hydrocephalus, if you're worried about increased intracranial pressure, um, you may be able to see um, uh, slit ventricles with that. If somebody has a tumor, you may be able to uh, uh, see that. Um, you may need to give gadolinium as well. Um, certain kinds of infections that can cause headache, herpes, uh, which can cause a, a focal meningoencephalitis, there may be some abnormalities. Somebody has uh, symptoms referable to the posterior fossa, vertiginous um, headaches, for example, um, then uh, MRI scan would definitely be the test of choice. And you'd also want to give uh, gadolinium for that as well. So if you don't know the best tests to order in terms of imaging and you have a patient with a headache, you want to do the, the imaging that's going to get you the best results. I just find it it's so helpful um, if you've got colleagues that you know that you can call or text or whatever, and just ask them what the clinic, what your clinical question is, what you might be looking for, ask them to help you plan the test. Um, I found that to be really useful. So catacil, cerebral aut autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts. I'm going to show you a picture of this. This is a presentation that can look migrainous. The MRI scan can really surprise you. Uh, this is an inherited uh, uh, condition. Um, there's a notch three gene mutation that's associated with it. You can get testing for this often. Um, it presents with migraines that are pretty typical, but also multiple strokes. So if you see that combination, make sure that you get an MRI scan and make sure that you think about catacil. It can progress to dementia. And people who have it, as they get worse, they'll have cognitive deterioration. They may have seizures, and that's another um, sign that, that may help you think about what's going on. They often will have psychiatric illness. And like I said, genetic testing is available. Um, this is a nice uh, image. This is just from a stock study. This does not belong to any one given patient, okay? Um, but you can see this kind of uh, odd looking white matter uh, change. It doesn't look like multiple sclerosis. It's not discrete lesions. It's not the tiny punctate lesions that are nonspecific, but we often see with, with uh, uh, migraine. It has a pretty distinctive appearance. And so this is something that your radiology colleagues will recognize and can alert you to um, and help you understand. So if you see a patient with migraines, history of stroke, family history that goes along with this, migraines and seizure, um, my psychiatric disease plus minus, you definitely would want to get an MRI scan in that situation. And catacil is another um, process that is a good board question because it's so specific and because there is this mutation uh, associated with it, the, the notch three gene mutation. So um, I want to talk about Cal Fleming syndrome. This is reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. Um, it causes a headache that can last for weeks. It can also cause thunderclap headaches, focal neurologic signs. It can look for all the world like a stroke, it can cause seizures, a lot of triggers. The most recent case of this I saw we thought was triggered by um, the person using uh, uh, marijuana case that I saw before that, um, the likely inciting uh, cause was, um, I think it was an SSRI. So it can really uh, vary tremendously. 
Um, but think about it when you've got somebody with a headache that's lasting for weeks, multiple thunderclap headaches and focal neurologic signs. And uh, there's a nice arrow right here. You can see the spasm, you can see the, the narrowing in this, in this artery specifically. Um, so you do want to do arterial imaging, um, MR angiogram or preferably CT angiogram would, would be another good way to look for this. So what are labs and other tests that we do for people with headaches? Case specific, you know, does somebody have a, a giant cell arteritis? You'd want to get a sed rate, you'd want to get a, a C-reactive protein. Um, I actually had a case report of a patient who presented with a new onset headache. Um, she actually sent me a picture of herself. She swept her hair back on her face. Her temple artery was huge, um, really odd looking appearance. Both her sed rate and her CGRP were normal. Um, we did ultrasounds of her temporal arteries and were able to see a tremendous spasm. Um, she did very well on steroids. Um, here in New England, we might check for Lyme disease, which um, in its tertiary form can cause an ongoing headache. Um, our present situation with uh, uh, coronavirus can present with headache as one of the initial symptoms. Um, I think if you're seeing a patient with new onset headache by itself without other other symptoms. I don't know that that would be an indication to start out with uh, testing for COVID, um, but uh, something at least right now to think about. Um, would you want to do an EEG? If there's any change in level of consciousness, if there's an aura that's odd, like an olfactory aura that's not typical for a migraine, um, that might be helpful. If somebody's having syncope with their headaches, you definitely would want to do a cardiac workup in that situation. So we get to treatment. Um, so thinking about medication versus integrative, for both, we want to offer our patients evidence-based treatment with medication. How to monitor is really important. You've got to get your patients enlisted in keeping um, some kind of a diary. And I have a couple of apps that I'll mention that, that can be useful. Ecology of the patient. If you have somebody with comorbid hypertension, for example, that might influence you to pick one treatment over another. And patient preference. Patients often... They Google, despite what we tell them, don't visit Dr. Google, it's recipe for disaster, they're going to do it. I, I feel like at this point I've incorporated it into the way that I practice, um, try to answer those questions and really hit them on the head um, because you know the patient's gonna be looking. They may say, I read about this and I don't wanna do it. You may be able to explain to them why that doesn't apply to them. In terms of the integrative treatments, um, you want to think about the safety of some of the, the possibilities. What's the out-of-pocket cost, which can be tremendous. And again, patient preference. My research is around integrative uh, treatments for headache and pain, among other things. Um, so a lot of people come to see me because they know that if appropriate, I might suggest a non-drug treatment. Um, you have to have access to those, those kinds of treatments. And you have to know the practitioners to some degree as well. So... How are you going to make the decisions? I will refer you to the American Academy of Neurology 2012 guidelines for migraine. They're excellent. Um, they are in the process now of being updated. It seems sad to me that they're eight years old because the field has moved forward quite a bit. Basically, when you're starting someone on a preventive treatment, you want to start low and titrate up. Um, it's not like treating for seizures where you're aiming for a certain dose. It's not like you're treating for hypertension where there's a clear biomarker that is blood pressure that you can look at. You're treating to efficacy. You're looking for the minimal effective dose, which can actually be quite low for a lot of patients. So I don't go faster than a two-week increase, and I ask people to keep a keep a journal. This is really important in the world of headache, review contraception. Um, if it's indicated more so now with the new drugs that we have, these calcitonin gene-related peptide monoclonal antibodies, I will explain those in a minute. Um, but there's no safety data to date about pregnancy on, on these drugs. There are contraindications for some of the FDA-approved uh, oral medications for migraines. So um, you want to make sure that your patient knows that, that you've documented it, and that you've reviewed it. And then in terms of abortif abortive medications, um, stratification, you know, are there patients who just need an abortive drug? Does everyone need to be on a preventive drug? I would argue no, based on the frequency and the disability from the headaches. So for migraine, here are your choices. Um, antihypertensives, FDA approved. Uh, anticonvulsants, this is, is not in any specific order. Uh, 
FDA approved um, valproic acid, topiramate, antihypertensive, Tensis, propranolol, metoprolol, um, off-label but evidenced for rapamil uh, would, uh, uh, would be a, a choice. Antidepressants, we sometimes use the older tricyclic antidepressants such as um, amitriptyline and nortriptyline. Antispasmodics such as baclofen, tizanidine, onibotulinum toxin, which is 31 injections administered in what's called the preempt protocol every 90 days, um, is a good option for patients, but they have to meet that chronic migraine criteria. Drug is very expensive to get it approved by most insurers. Patients have to have tried and failed other oral medications first. And then these new monoclonal antibodies, which are very cool, um, they are uh, once a month injections for the most part. There is an intravenous infusion, which is once every three months that got approved in February. I, our group has not yet given it due to the pandemic. We weren't able to get started. We're now trying to think about that a little bit. These are targeted treatments. They target calcitonin gene-related peptide, which is uh, released from the meninges at the start of a migraine due to that cascade that I showed you before. Um, it's a, basically, it's a kind of a circuit and capture. Um, one of these uh, drugs, arenamab, blocks at the receptor, galcanazumab and frepanazumab block the uh, CGRP itself, maybe a little bit more effective, although there aren't good head-to-head -head trials. Um, side effects, they hurt. Uh, you can't get pregnant while you're taking them. That's not really a side effect. Um, Patients can develop constipation, which can be quite severe, got a black box warning for Renamab, and uh, a newer warning has come out about potential, especially for patients with hypertension to begin with, if they can elevate blood pressure, they can cause fatigue. Um, there are now hundreds of thousands of people on these drugs in, in the US, um, and uh, there's not been any other serious side effect signal that's emerged to date. Um, they are very expensive out of pocket. They're about $7,000 a year. Insurers will cover them. They all have their own little schemas. They're paperwork for all of us, right? We have to do uh, uh, prior authorization letters, but the results can be so dramatic. And I'm having this experience now of doing my Zoom patient follow-up visits and hearing person after person talk about life-changing, which is really kind of amazing. If you think of you know, what's placebo effect, it's about a 30% reduction for these drugs, um, I can give you statistics similar to uh, onobotulinum toxin. About half of the people using them have a 50% reduction, which is pretty good. About 40% have a 70% reduction in some studies. There are patients who are super responders. We don't have a good way to predict who's going to be in that class. But I have patients who really have stopped getting migraines or get very few, and they're really not very severe. So again, worth a try. Definitely want to know that they are available that they're out there and they may be a good option. Abortives, um, we've got the tryptan medication, sumatriptan being first in class. We've got the ergots. There are potentials for side effects with those. Um, they do work very well for a lot of patients. Um, Anti-inflammatories such as ibuprofen can be very effective. Anti-nausea medications such as ondansetron can help. G-pants are a newer uh, category as well. There are two approved drugs in that class, abrojapant being one of them. Um, these these are uh, CGRP antagonists. These are drugs that work on the same neuropeptide, but, but a little bit differently. Um, be careful if you use these. Again, no safety data during pregnancy. Um, and you cannot use a tryptian within 24 hours of using one. So patients really have to you know, kind of make a, a, a decision. OK, I'm going to give this a try. But if it doesn't work, I may have my my migraine for however long until it's safe for me to use a different medication. Um, little to no role for narcotics or barbiturates, um, older combination uh, formulation that we're probably all familiar with with barbiturates. Sometimes uh, uh, butalbital, uh, caffeine, acetaminophen combination is uh, okayed by obstetricians during pregnancy, um, but again, very likely to cause patients to get into a rebound situation, so I try to avoid those. Um, think about hormonal estrogen progesterone formulations for women who have 
menstrual migraines specifically, if you can suppress cycling, they may do a lot better. However, if somebody has aura, you want to avoid this. The risk of having a stroke increases fairly substantially. There are some changes now being worked on in terms of guidelines for safe prescribing. But at this point, for someone with with migraine with aura, I would try to avoid the estrogen progesterone formulations of, of uh, oral contraceptives. And then the role of HRT, no data to support this for postmenopausal headaches at this point, although it does uh, anecdotally help a lot of women feel better and can help with climacteric symptoms as well. So maybe something to consider if it's appropriate for other reasons. Um, in terms of tension type headaches, everything's off label, nothing's labeled specifically. Antidepressants, such as the tricyclic antidepressants, anticonvulsants are sometimes used, the antispasmodics, um, with the thought that there is some component of muscle spasm can be helpful. And then anti inflammatory medications in addition to that. So, uh, again, ibuprofen for somebody with an occasional tension type headache may be just fine, and that's all they need. The trigeminal autonomic cephalgias, we already talked about indomethacin. Triptans are used for cluster headache. They have to be a pretty uh, frequent dosing. The uh, sumatriptan injectable tends to work the best, or the zolmatriptan nasal spray is also another good option. Um, calcium channel blockers such as uh, verapamil are are often used in high doses, so you want to be careful with that. Steroids can help to break a cycle. Um, there's debate about lithium, and what I don't have on this slide, and I'm sorry, I just realized this, is that one of those monoclonal antibodies, galcanazumab, um, has been approved at a higher dose for um, cluster headaches, and so that actually can be uh, really, really effective, and it's definitely worth considering for your cluster patients. Um, procedures that can help, nerve blocks, basically anesthetizing, numbing the area of the head that's in pain. This works best for people who have frequent headaches. Trigger point injections can help with muscle spasm. I talked about onobotulinum toxin uh, for the patients who have chronic migraine. Transcranial magnetic stimulation is being looked at. It's not evidenced. Migraine surgery, no good data to support this. Um, and a really nice statement from the American Headache Society suggesting that as physicians, we steer our patients away from this until randomized controlled studies can be done uh, to, to try to evidence it or not. But I haven't seen anything that's been convincing for me in terms of migraine surgery um, to date. And then I'll just show you quickly, this is the migraine headband. It got fast-tracked by the FDA. 53% of people had a response to it. Um, 47% of people who used a placebo had the same response. It's expensive. People have to pay for it. I don't recommend it. Integrative therapies, I'm just going to mention some of these for which there is some data. Yoga, mindfulness, both cognitive behavioral therapies and meditation type therapies, Tai Chi, certain herbs, butterbur being one of them. You have to be very careful because butterbur can have a toxin in it called pure lotusine alkaloid that can actually really damage someone's liver. If you are using it, you want to make sure the, the butterbur is pure lotusine alkaloid free and that your patient cycles off after six months of using. Um, other vitamins and supplements, there's data to support magnesium in high doses of 500 milligrams a day. Um, uh, vitamin B2, riboflavin can be helpful. Nutrition, there's no good data. All those um, uh, thoughts about avoiding uh, cheese and chocolate and red wine, it's mythic. Um, there are certain things that can be a trigger for any individual patient, but what we really know about how to eat for migraines is you want to keep your blood sugar steady. You want to try to eat something close to the Mediterranean diet, which is how we all want to eat, right? Lean protein, fruits and vegetables, uh, not a lot of processed food. You know, Michael Palin moment, eat real food, mostly plants, not too much. Um, acupuncture, pretty good amount of data for to support this for migraines. And massage, it, there is some data for this as well. Um, it can help to loosen up uh, uh, tight muscles and spasm for people with migraines, people with tension type headaches. The apps that I mentioned for tracking, there's one called iHeadache, there's My Migraine, 
There's one that a lot of patients use called Migraine Buddy. Um, I learned that they actually, I think this is accurate, uh, put the um, data together in aggregate and basically make a profit off it in terms of determining other migraine activities, which made me sort of sour on Migraine Buddy. Patients like it, though. They can upload it. And they can send you their diary. I don't really care what it is. I don't care if it's just a list of the migraines, as long as I have some data about how people are doing and how frequently they're having a headache. Um, okay, so I actually did it. I got through um, a lot of the background that I wanted to give you, and I've got some cases, some with some questions for you to answer, and then two teaching cases that I'll try to get to at the end. Um, so case number one, we've got Jane, 24 years old, grad student, no medical problems beside headache, gets one several times a month, throbbing pain, usually behind her right eye, preceded by a floating wedge shape that glows and crosses from one side to the other needs a dark and quiet room when it happens, usually occurs one day before her period and mid-cycle. So diagnosis, and I'll give you a minute. Choices, migraine with aura, menstrual migraine, TIA, tension type headache, Okay, so I, I still see people voting um, and we're having, okay, so the two choices that people picked were menstrual migraine and migraine with aura. Um, so technically to be pure menstrual migraine, it would only occur with her period. And a migraine that occurs mid cycle like this uh, is a little bit of a deviant from, from the diagnosis, but um, the correct answer, if you had to just pick one, would be migraine with aura, because that's what she's having, even though there's that association with her menstrual period. Okay, question two, how would you treat this person? Continuous combined oral contraceptive, trial of topiramate as a preventive, Abortive plan, a tryptian medication may be taken with an NSAID or an over-the-counter medication. And she's getting uh, probably two migraines a month. So I'll give you a minute. Okay, so um, the majority of you picked um, a tryptan plus an NSAID, which is the answer that I, I would choose myself. Um, a trial of topiramate. So would you want to have her take a daily preventive medication when she's only getting two migraines a month? Maybe if they were so disabling that she was missing two days of work a month, that's, that's a lot. Um, but the first thing to do, you know, minimum drug, uh, try, let's see if we can just turn this headache off by using a tryptian and let's add it to an NSAID, um, which often potentiates the tryptian. So you would not want to use uh, estrogen containing uh oral contraceptive, because this is someone who has migraine with aura and uh, her stroke risk is increased. And you could actually use over-the-counter um, choices. And that's that's not a bad option, too. I do want to tell you a, a board um, uh, pearl, which is they will only ask you to select things if they give you choices. The right answer is always going to be something that is FDA approved um, with these headache questions. So tryptian and an NSAID, both of these would, would be a good choice for this. Okay, case two, we've got Ashley, a 19-year-old college student, throbbing pain over her forehead and under her eyes, worse with movement. We, we, ha yeah. we have three minutes uh, before we have to go to the next presentation. 
Okay. Three, I'm sorry. So I'm going to finish this one and then I'm going to show you one of my teaching cases um, and then uh, wrap up. So worse with movement, light bothers her, slight nausea, runny nose, some tearing, very anxious about school headaches and life. And uh, sorry, um, oh, I missed this here. Um, okay, so any questions uh, about this? Um, I'm sorry, diagnosis here, answer choices. Is this sinus headache? Is this migraine without aura? Or is this attention type headache? Um, Okay, so I'm going to stop here because I'm running out of time uh, per my, my warning from Dr. Henderson here. This is tension type headache, right? So I'm going to just show you because I think this is a really uh, great um, teaching point. She doesn't meet the criteria for migraine without aura. And what I want you to remember here, the headache attributed to rhinosinusitis, which is a sinus headache, you have to have evidence of sinus disease either on CAT scan, by endoscopy, or by purulent drainage. Um, you know, which is basically stuff coming out of your nose, and it has to be resolved completely within seven days after the treatment. And it's it's often overdiagnosed um, and overtreated with with antibiotics. So steer clear of that. Um, okay, I'm going to skip here. Um, I've got a couple other uh, unusual cases that I, I think probably they're just interesting, but they probably would not show up on uh, board type questions. You would get a migraine question, a cluster headache type question, a catasol question, some of the things that I mentioned earlier. But I do want to show you um, this is a patient that I saw, a 47-year-old woman with aura, never had complications from her headache, uh, was getting remarried, a cis woman marrying a cis man, was placed on the birth control pat patch for contraception, uh, did not have a family history of migraine with aura, um, but she began to develop leg cramps, muscle, was told she had muscle spasms, then shortness of breath, eventually body weakness, and uh, she ended up having a sagittal sinus thrombosis. This was a really terrible situation. You can see the lesion here. This is not her film. This is just a, a stock slide. Um, I saw her. She ended up um, on multiple anticonvulsants. She came to see me for a second opinion. It was very, very difficult to treat her. Uh, went on and on. Um, she ended up having a, a stroke from the sagittal sinus thrombosis, and it was really a tragic endpoint. And as it turned out, she was factor five Leiden positive. She had migraine with aura and uh, uh, had been placed on a, a contraceptive pill that had quite a bit of, of estrogen in on, on a patch, quite a bit of estrogen in it. So watch out for that. These are some websites that are on my slides that I think um, might be useful. And uh, I'll just close with this um, cartoon. And I have six seconds. So thank you all very much. Dr. Mersing, thank you uh, so much uh, for that exciting presentation. You know, it's amazing how far we've, we've come with uh, migraine therapy. Uh, I, it, I think for neurology in general, there's just a tremendous amount of therapy that we did not have. Uh, 10 to 15 uh, years ago. So uh, thank you for that great presentation. Uh, for those questions that were sent in by uh, text, uh, I will accumulate those and hopefully we'll be able to answer those later in the afternoon. If not, I'll email those to Dr. Bernstein so she can hopefully uh, get back uh, to the group.